All right. Um, just being mindful of time, I think we'll get started. Hi, hi everybody. My name is Minnie. I'm a second year medical student, and I'll be moderating uh, today's workshop. And um, just uh, before we start, we'd like to let you know that this event is organized by DASH, the UBC Data and Health Cluster. And uh, the, the vision of DASH is to develop a harmonized data ecosystem that can accommodate multimodal and multidimensional data. And um, these series of workshops are dedicated towards that as well. Um, and I will also introduce our speaker, Dr. Anna Goldenberg. So Dr. Um, Goldenberg is a Varma Family Chair in Biomedical Informatics and Artificial Intelligence at SickKids Research Institute. She is an Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto, Faculty Member and an Associate Research Director, Health at Vector Institute and Canadian AI Chair at CIFAR, as well as a member of CIFAR's Child and Brain Development Group. Dr. Goldenberg, um, trained in machine learning at Carnegie Milton University with a postdoc focus in computational biology and medicine. The current focus of her lab is on developing machine learning methods that capture heterogeneity in complex human diseases, as well as developing risk prediction and early warning clinical systems. Dr. Goldenberg is strongly committed to creating responsible AI to benefit uh, patients uh, across a variety of conditions. So um, we will do the Zoom virtual um, clap to welcome Dr. Gold, Gold, Dr. Goldenberg. Thank you. Thank you, Mini. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let me see where it went. All right. Uh, can everybody see the screen well and hear me uh, well? Maybe yeah. some people. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to share with you our recent work and our findings in deploying and developing AI for healthcare. And there are many learnings that have been made and still many that uh, um, areas and avenues that we are still exploring and learning from. So most of you have seen AI or machine learning in a variety of contexts, especially as related to robotics and imaging. So radiology and pathology have been on the forefront of um, the beneficiaries of uh, AI applications because of the sort of the, the standardized formats that the data um, is in and because it's been recorded in a very structured database and easy access. Um, it's not true of all the uh, various medical um, specialties, but there are so many areas that would really benefit. And I want to share with you a few of our um, projects and areas where we have contributed AI to. And um, but there are many more. So first, uh, and I wanted to say that if you have any, if anybody has any clarification questions, I'm not checking the chat, but Minnie is, and she can uh, just uh, uh, ask and stop me and ask a question at any point. Uh, so uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, and I'm uh, super happy to answer any questions you might have. So uh, uh, here's an example number one. It's a prediction problem uh, with a likelihood of thyroid uh, nodule malignancy. So probably many of you know, but um, uh, thyroid cancer is not determined uh, finally and fully until resection. So um, if there's a suspicion of malignancy, there was an ultrasound followed by if there is a further suspicion followed by biopsy and uh, then surgery. And so what happens as a result of this is that 67% uh, of the surgeries, um, at least that are done here at CKIDS, um, found nodule to be benign. 
so didn't necessarily uh, need to be resected. So working with uh, Jonathan Wasserman, um, we uh, have developed a machine learning uh, algorithm uh, that it says in review it has been accepted, um, but um, uh, it has been accepted recently. But um, it's a it's a model that uh, basically would allow to reduce uh, the the number of unnecessary surgeries from sixty seven to thirty percent or even fewer. Um, another example: uh, anomaly detection. So this is cancer screening and predisposed kids. In particular, we are working with the, Dr. David Malkin here uh, uh, and focusing on Lee Fraumeni syndrome. So this is a cancer predisposition syndrome often associated with a mutation in the TP53 gene. And cancers can occur at any age and on almost any body organ. There's a, a bit of a bias um, of a sort of a certain cancers appearing at certain age, breast cancers being later, and then the cortical carcinomas that are more frequent in earlier ages, but it's hard to know where uh, a cancer would start and when it would start. So the, um, there is 40% um, of a uh, chance of cancer appearing before the age of 25. So there is a um, screening program uh, that, especially since it runs in families, there's a screening program uh, for the kids uh, to try to catch it early because that's basically the best uh, way um, for a um, uh, positive outcome. So uh, what, uh, what happens is that these individuals come in uh, every half a year or so, and they have blood tests. And uh, if uh, sort of there's suspicion of malignancy, they undergo a whole body MRI uh, procedure. And uh, the problem with this, with this uh, procedure is that even for very experienced radiologists, as they tell me, it's really difficult to uh, find this cancer because it's a screening program, right? Cancer is still a speck, it can happen anywhere in the body. So uh, what uh, also this means uh, that because it's a cancer predisposition uh, syndrome, it's also fairly rare. So they don't uh, work with whole body MRI uh, modality and there are not a lot of images. And as you probably know for AI and uh, machine learning, it's really difficult uh, to, to learn from limited data sets. So uh, what we have done is we have taken a lot of the healthy um, you know, whole body MRIs without the cancer legions. And we have built a system that can help us to generate um, more um, sort of simulated uh, whole body MRI images that we can later use to augment our data and uh, to make a prediction. And what we do is um, in the final, um, procedure in an algorithm, we actually take a, an image, compare it to the uh, pool of, of the healthy images and, and ask where uh, is something unexpected. So to highlight for, for the algorithm to highlight something unexpected across the body. And sometimes we get, of course, the, the sort of the contours because those are most uh, different, but um, it actually helps to get rid of a lot of the noise in the image and um, uh, focus on some of the potential uh, lesions, helping radiologists to, to not miss uh, these cancers. Um, a reinforcement learning uh, is, uh, I don't know if you uh, have heard this term, it's a term in, um, a sort of a, a specific area, sub area in uh, machine learning field, which uh, defines optimal policies and looks for policies. So in particular, in this case, we were looking to um, identify optimally tests in ICU to improve the, the most information received for patient treatment. So the policy uh, that the algorithm that we have defined is a dynamic policy that says, okay, at this point, uh, we can, um, we, we don't need additional information, but given uh, the information that we had in the past, at this point, it would really help to know 
um, the result of this test or this other test. And so uh, what uh, uh, this work allows is to uh, reduce, uh, reduce the cost and earlier detect some of the issues that arise in ICU in particular that this work was applied to. Um, this uh, this uh, shows the result of the estimated gains from the method. And uh, in blue is our approach. And in green, is sort of, if you just test more or less randomly, which is not what's done, but if you test, uh, if the tests are done uh, frequently, um, then um, without uh, taking into account uh, the state of the patient, um, you the uh, there is a, a lot less information, and it arrives. It may arrive too late. So um, you can see that the physician policy is here in red. Is what was observed in the data, and here we use the publicly available data set mimic. Um, ICU data set. So um, uh, if our policy were used to decide on when and which test to do, we could reduce the cost by about 38% and gain a lot more information at the time, at the same time that uh, the policy uh, that physicians uh, use would be done. Um, another example, and this example will come up. Um, Later on as well, this is a time series prediction, um, um, uh, specifically uh, predicting uh, probability of the cardiac arrest in uh, ICU in critical care here at SickKids. Um, <clears throat> the issue with critical care is that uh, they've been monitoring, uh, not just monitoring, but also storing a lot of the uh, data that comes out of the Philips monitors, actually all of the data that comes out of all of the Philips monitors. And um, uh, Peter Lawson, whose slide uh, I, I took this uh, from, uh, who was the previous head of the critical care unit, he compared the amount of data uh, deluge with a, a, a amount of water that goes through Niagara Falls per second. And uh, it actually is comparable with uh, cubic centimeters to uh, bits of, of, of information. So it's a lot of data uh, to be processing at all times. And what we have done is we have designed an algorithm jointly with our ICU colleagues to, um, to take this data in streaming fashion and uh, predict uh, the risk of cardiac arrest at each given point in time for each of the patients. And what uh, we are currently able to do is detect up to 70% of cardiac arrests up to two hours prior to the event. So that's the window in which we detect. For some of the patients, we can detect earlier and some of the patients we can't detect earlier. You can see it sort of spikes up uh, just before, uh, the physiological data spikes up just before uh, the, the event. It's not possible to detect much in advance. So um, the final um, uh, example, and also a very important one, is uh, an operational improvement project uh, in a hospital. So here, the goal was to help uh, with staff planning in the emergency department at SeaKids, and um, basically to uh, have a 24-hour uh, running forecast of expected number and the range of the expected number of patients uh, in uh, the emergency department at our hospital. And um, what we actually focused on is on the escalation points. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we precisely predict the escalation events. So from 30, uh, at 30, at 37, and at 47 cutoffs that are currently actionable at the hospital and are prescribed in the, in the system. So our problem here was that, um, uh, that COVID happened in the emergency department uh, was uh, a place where uh, you could actually see a huge drop in the number of patients. Um, I mean, COVID happened ev everywhere, but policies were designed differently in different places. And in the pediatric hospital, um, the number of emergency uh, visits actually dropped and dropped pretty unpredictably. So uh, we had 200,000 uh, of the C kids emergency 
uh, visits, uh, information over the last three years. And we used all of this data to devise a system that would make a prediction. And here you can see um, sort of in uh, the dots, you can see are the observed patients and in uh, the line is uh, the prediction. And actually this is run in real time. We are no longer touching the system. The system is run in real time in our emergency department. Uh, right now, we, it's not being shown to, to the clinicians to be making the decisions, but uh, the system has been validated to have the exact uh, precision that we expected it to have over time. So this is, um, this is the uh, sort of uh, the latest uh, information from the October. So uh, these are some of the examples of the projects that we have, and we have more projects, and it all sort of sounds exciting, but I have to tell you that um, our, um, that none of these projects are actually right now affecting clinical decisions at the hospital. And uh, this, this is not uh, just uh, sort of our uh, issue. There are over 25,000 uh, papers that are written in AI in, in healthcare um, uh, just uh, uh, a year and a half ago. And um, only a very, very small percentage of them are getting deployed. So the percentage is growing, which is very exciting, but um, not uh, as fast as this technology is getting developed. And the question is why? What does it actually take? So I can tell you that in my experience, the main, main, main impediment uh, to this deployment is uh, physical access to the data and sometimes access to the compute. But actual physical access to the data is really hard to obtain. Um, and getting access to EPIC, for example, for clinical decision support tools is difficult. Uh, people build systems to be able to do this uh, and apply AI models to that data. They extract the data out of EPIC, do some uh, computation uh, outside and then feed it back at some of the institutions, not here yet. So this is one of the biggest impediments, I think, to deployment. And another one, is, which is very important, is that there have to be very clear approvals and governance frameworks in place at the point of deployment to be able to, to see. So uh, these are all the things we need to do right here. Uh, check and check and check and check. And there may be many, and this is fine, but they have to be very well defined. And right now there is no standardization in the world um, of, for, for these uh, governance that, for example, if you wanted to build it tomorrow, um, you, you would know exactly what to do. So everybody builds sort of based on their best, uh, best estimation, best, best uh, thought process. <clears throat> so what, uh, what needs to be done is that the systems have to be in place. Uh, it takes a lot of people to make sure uh, that it actually comes to fruition. So it's not just the clinical champions and uh, machine learners, but it's also the hospital IT um, that has to be on board and make sure that the systems run real time. I can tell you that for our AD census um, example, um, there was a the, the funny uh, thing happened is that uh, th the daylight savings uh, completely threw it off because in Epic, they just uh, store the date of the day daylight savings as the same date that was like one hour ago. So at 3 a.m. they changed the, the daylight savings and it's 3 a.m. at 3 a.m. post time and 3 a.m. at 4 a.m. Uh, of the old time. And so um, I threw our system off because it wasn't uh, properly referencing the time and we couldn't be, we shouldn't have been using Epic's time, but these are some of the things that you get to find out when uh, the system is running real time. Um, and then uh, other uh, questions that are being asked uh, by the AI folks that uh, are being addressed, are they actionable? That's very important. And finally, there are quite a few of the kinks that uh, AI still needs to iron out uh, to make sure that the system uh, 
is really reliable and robust. So I'll talk to you about some of the AI challenges that I know about and that uh, we have encountered, are aware of, and are trying to avoid, but I'm sure there are many more. So one um, very big is the, the lack of context, right? So all of the uh, electronic records uh, and other places uh, where the data is stored at the hospital, they, um, they store the data, but they don't store why certain decisions are being uh, being made, right? So this is actually uh, coming from a publication by uh, Rich Caruana, and it happened at one of the um, of uh, big hospitals in uh, in the U.S., uh, which is the AI system uh, was learning um, to to predict. Um, the the severity of us uh, of pneumonia, and um, what the data has shown is that uh, people uh, with asthma they have uh, fewer bad outcomes. The reason is is because there is a policy in place and they are treated more aggressively, but um, as a result there are fewer patients that are dying. Uh, of pneumonia who have asthma due to this uh, more aggressive treatment. So the system learned that it is actually good to have asthma uh, if, you, if you have pneumonia. And of course, this is, this is not the medical knowledge that we will want AI to learn, but this is the kind of knowledge they can, uh, that the system can infer from the data because the data is there. So this policy uh, creep uh, has to be, is a confounding uh, information here. Um, in our own project in the thyroid cancer, uh, when we decided to validate our system, we had a tiny anecdotal set of 10 patients. And in seven benign pa patients who had surgery, we predicted that only two of them uh, should have had surgery. Um, but what's more worrisome is that in uh, three malignant patients that had surgery, we predicted that only two of them should have had surgery. And we went back with Jonathan and we said, well, uh, why, why, what's happening with this last patient? Because our system was fairly certain that uh, this, um, this was not malignant. And uh, Jonathan said, oh yes, I know this patient. It turned out that there was a history in the family which made me look closer and we did the surgery anyway. And uh, we weren't sure that it was gonna be malignant but it ended up being malignant because of this history. And this history was not available to the algorithm. So there was no way for the algorithm to have learned the right decision if that is basically the sole um, point uh, and feature uh, that would make uh, the prediction of malignancy possible. <clears throat> the encoding the bias and the data and making the solutions, right? This is very common and people have started talking about this, but it's still happening. So this is uh, an anecdotal case uh, that happened in uh, another very big uh, hospital system in the US where uh, this was deployed in Epic and it was available in Epic. I don't know if it's still available, but um, a system that was predicting a no show for the appointments. And uh, the way that a uh, big medical system chose to operate this is that uh, basically for all the um, predicted no shows of the appointments, they double booked those individuals. And when uh, the data science unit uh, that was uh, uh, working also in the same medical system, when they took a look, they saw that the people who got uh, double, double booked were all uh, sort of uh, African-American and uh, uh, poor, poor people. And um, when they checked uh, the, the, predictive, the predictive system that they have deployed, it turned out that it basically only used race and socioeconomic status to make these predictions. And maybe in a lot of cases, um, these people couldn't, couldn't come due to a variety of reasons, but the whole point of the medical system is to become better um, and not, not worse. And basically this system that was de deployed was exacerbating this, uh, this bias uh, that was already existing in the data. Um, this is a very common, uh, uh, 
question and one that we are constantly worried about, especially when we are building uh, predictive sy systems for imaging, what are we actually learning, right? So are we learning uh, the particular machine that the imaging was done or particular settings that the, um, uh, the, the, the imaging was done? Because sometimes when there is a suspicion of uh, a severe case, um, it's done on a different, a better machine, uh, right? And so what the algorithm ends up uh, learning and, and discriminating on is, is not uh, the real issue with a patient, but actually the quality of the machine, which you can predict perfectly, but that's not at all uh, what's needed, right? So this was a published uh, paper where they found that uh, they were trying to predict pneumonia, but the system learned uh, to predict whether there was a metal token, a particular kind in uh, uh, the image. Another, this one is a bit of a more nuanced issue and uh, one that we are currently working with and trying to understand. But um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the questions, that AI is being applied to in the hospital setting is related to uh, rare conditions and rare events. So for example, uh, we were predicting cardiac arrest. There are only about a hundred cardiac arrests in um, our ICU in, uh, at SickKids per year, right? But if you think about, uh, how many times we have to make a prediction per year? How many times uh, we have to make a prediction is for 30 beds, we are making a prediction, let's say every five minutes of every day, every week of the year, right? So that's a lot of predictions. So even if we had 1% error and our error is much higher, even when we had 1% error, we would have 30,000 false positives per year for every 100 true positives, right? And we as machine learners, we got really concerned and we said, well, who would want to use the system? But working with uh, our clinical collaborators, we basically started understanding that the goal is not necessarily, and for them to use the system is not necessarily to predict the cardiac arrest itself, but to actually get the estimate of the risk of deterioration for the patient. And that's a much more frequent event. And patients deteriorate in a variety of ways. And, um, but there are no labels. There are no labels for deterioration in the system. And so this is something that we are working on uh, defining right now. And the one uh, final um, sort of concern that we started working on and trying to address with a, a AI methodology is what happens if the system is deployed, it's running, the clinicians are starting to trust the system, but the system has errors because all the systems will have errors because of the previous um, you know, highlighted issues. There's not enough context, not all the features are measured, the data is imprecise, some of the decisions were erroneous. So the system will always make errors. And uh, it turns out that if the error rate is, is fairly high in the system, then depending on the level of trust, so blind trust you can see is in brown and blue is uh, sort of trust in half of the decisions of the system. Over time, um, the false positive rate, which is depicted here on the y-axis, over time, the system will start getting worse. We can't not retrain the system. We can't not retrain the system because we have new data, there are data shifts, all kinds of th things happen. It, especially it became obvious that we have to retrain the systems during COVID. Uh, our ED census uh, system that I talked about, we retrain it daily uh, to make sure that it's making very good predictions. So that's fine. Um, but uh, so this is, this is an important point is that every time we retrain, the new labels are the labels that uh, are being obtained by clinicians making the decisions while being influenced by the machine, by the machine's uh, suggestions. And that's what we call the feedback loop problem or the 
uh, error amplification in the system. So we, uh, we have uh, published a paper highlighting uh, this issue before, and we are in the process of um, submitting a paper which talks about when um, it's a real issue and how to deal with it and when it's not really an issue. And when the system has very low error rate, it turns out that it doesn't deteriorate fast enough to worry about it, which is a good thing. There are many, many other issues that I haven't really talked about, but um, not, um, for example, people are not optimizing the right thing. So in our uh, ED census uh, model, we actually focused on uh, positive escalation, right? So the number of patients is likely to grow. This is what we care about uh, getting right. It doesn't really matter if we don't uh, capture the de-escalation uh, as carefully, uh, as long as we capture the escalation as carefully, because the, the system has to be prepared to accept more patients for it to function properly. Um, uh, not determining the condition and, uh, under which the model is valid, right? Or um, not flagging it to the clinician when making a decision for a patient that it has never seen, right? This is an important point. Uh, the the data that we train our systems are uh, finite. And we have seen maybe a great variety of patients in the big metropolitan hospitals, but haven't seen all, all of uh, possible patients. And sometimes a patient comes in and is of course uh, much more affecting the minority, underrepresented minorities, is that our confidence in making a decision for a patient that, uh, or a set of patients that we haven't seen a lot of is going to be lower. And that has to be taken into account. Um, may, many, many other uh, issues and, and concerns, of course. And what's very important once these issues are addressed, and of course, a lot of you who are developing uh, tools to be used are already thoughtful of some of these issues and are thinking more about others, but there has to be a robust pipeline to deployment. Otherwise the system will just be there sitting either in a paper form or in some GitHub and it's just not going to, to move forward and help patients. So the data access has to be streamlined. It has to be sort of an enterprise level ideally. And um, the engine that brings the data into the compute in into the computational uh, toolbox in a tool to the tool that uh, you've created it has to be very robust right it needs to be real time to be able to make this decision so for us for example for uh, physiological data stream that is compared to the niagara falls we had to develop a whole new streaming engine uh, because the amount of data was just so staggering and uh, that uh, systems engineers were involved. And, and this goes way beyond uh, uh, machine learning and data science. Um, we have to understand how often to retrain and update this model. This has to be decided before deployment, right? Um, for, for COVID cases, very highly non-stationary data might have to retrain it uh, very often. For other conditions, maybe not as often. So this, this has to be addressed. And, it's one thing that we are predicting, for example, mortality, but what we are displaying to the clinician, to the user, unless it's actionable, sometimes it's not going to be taken into account, right? So the user has to be uh, involved in the process right away to make sure that whatever is being brought back from the system to uh, the user can actually affect the decision-making process in a posit positive way. And finally, what is being what data is being collected to ensure that the model is being monitored, that the model is being impactful or not impactful, what kind of errors it's making? Is there a process by which the system is being uh, analyzed and improved over time? Uh, that has to be validated and in place. And I wanted to just show you, uh, sort of the, the example of the cardiac arrest prediction pipeline that we built. And this is from the bedside Phillips monitor. We have a data collection, uh, a pretty rigorous data collection um, procedure in a database where this data is stored. There is a, this uh, data pre-processing um, 
uh, pipeline and uh, the inference model. And we, what turned out is that we built our data pre-processing pipeline using um, some of the Microsoft uh, research tool called Trill, the dynamic engine called Trill. And um, we found that it's very buggy and uh, probably is not sufficiently uh, engineering quality enough to be run in real time. So we are currently thinking what is a system that may be a little bit slower, but uh, is, is less buggy that we can use in real time. And uh, finally, in this case, when we are trying to not just evaluate whether a cardiac arrest uh, prediction happens, but actually try to evaluate where whether deterioration is happening for which we don't have any labels, we actually designed a different interface. So first we ask, before showing the risk estimate, we actually ask, uh, and these are screenshots of the real system, um, we ask to estimate the risk level um, of deterioration for the for the patient and the clinician can drag this this sort of cross to 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 say where uh, they believe the risk is and then we show what actually the risk uh, was uh, based on the model and this is in in dashed lines and uh, what the, the clinician risk was uh, estimated to be and the clinician here can just take the predicted risk and drag it to where they think it's it's reality. And the reason why we are doing this is because as soon as clinician sees uh, how the risk has been evaluated over time, it will affect their decision. And so we are really um, giving them another chance to take that decision and incorporate into their final estimate. And then if uh, the, the risk has been dragged and has been modified from what the model has predicted, we ask to say a few words to justify why uh, the the risk level was adjusted. So uh, this this system has been developed. We are uh, testing it in a simulated environment so far, and we're expecting that to run a sort of trial uh, fashion in uh, in March. Um, so to summarize, uh, I know it's been a lot of information, but I think it's a very exciting field with a lot to share. There are many successes. Very true, there are many successes, but still a lot uh, remains to be done. So um, for those that are analytically oriented and driven, there are plenty of holes to fix in making machine learning more robust for healthcare applications. Um, we need uh, more sort of standardized guidelines to say the computational model is now evaluated and ready to be uh, put in production. This is, uh, this is key uh, to actually get it uh, to, to scale up um, across uh, the healthcare, the field of healthcare. Uh, there are many uh, questions to ask here. Rate of false alarms, um, check, check in for bias, uh, is the right team uh, on board to sort of maintain the system? What if something goes wrong? And finally, this pipelines from data access to the implementation in the clinic. As soon as that is in place, uh, scaling up is going to be uh, made a lot easier. And with that, I'd like to thank my amazing team um, and uh, my funders for helping me to do all this work. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldenberg. Um, that was a fascinating presentation and indeed lots of successes with machine learning implementa implementations in healthcare. There is one question from Dr. M um, about what is the spelling of the buggy Microsoft machine learning algorithm and at what stage do the bugs happen? I wrote it in the chat. The dynamic engine is called Trill. Um, I don't know if they ever put it as a their commercial product. This was a research pro pro product uh, that uh, our systems colleagues have recommended because it's much more efficient uh, than some of the well-known uh, production engines that are used in practice. Uh, the bugs were more about the, the caching and... Um, 
I don't know if I'll remember all the bugs now, but sort of uh, failing. Uh, there were points of failure for no good reason, something that could be caught and the system wasn't just catching them. It was just a uh, uh, core dump. Um, and having to do with efficient memory uh, management, et cetera. Um, uh, was there another question regarding this? Sorry. Um, I had a question. Thank you very much, Anna. It was a beautiful presentation. Um, and my question had to do with training of the algorithm and actually um, perhaps um, a feedback loop of the, you know, when patients are declining, because I think that that was really an interesting part of your discussion of that you were trying to predict heart attack, but really what the clinical outcome was clinical decline. Um, and as a patient's declining, clinicians take action to um, try and mitigate um, symptoms um, that they're seeing. That can be fed back into the algorithm and perhaps also when, you know, to physicians of saying, you know, you're predicting that there's a decline and or that there's a potential for a heart attack. Do you have recommended actions um, for them to take? Um, or are you also collecting information while you're in the process of training this of patient is declining, what actions were taken by the physician, and overall, did these were these positive actions that you could then use to actually train an algorithm to provide suggested actions if you were doing that? So those are my questions. Thank you. So that's a, that's a great question, and um, we would love to do that, but right now we don't actually have an easy way to collect that information due to our sort of we're still in the process of building um, access uh, pipeline for Epic and uh, the tools where the actions are ultimately being stored and recorded. We don't, one of the issues that we've encountered in talking to nurses, for example, on charge nurses in AD and uh, nurses in uh, ICU is that uh, they are worried about the uh, AI systems, just because a lot of the uh, t tech improvements that have come their way have put a, an undue burden uh, on sort of their time and, um, uh, and energy. And our goal is to really make sure that it's this, that the systems are as flawlessly integrated into the into their workflow as, as possible. And so right now, there is nothing we can do with that data because we don't even have access to what the actions have been taken in the past. But you're absolutely right that once we build this information um, out, then we'll be collecting uh, more and more of what has been done. And uh, that will be incorporated into the system. And hopefully at the next iteration of the system, we will actually be able to, to specify, okay, here are the actions that need to be taken uh, or may be taken and here are the associated risks. So these are, we follow uh, our ICU and uh, eMERGE colleagues in terms of what information they want to see and what information they don't want to see. There's actually a nuance to this which is um, uh, in ICU, uh, my understanding is it's quite prescribed. So all of these procedures, and uh, again, I'm speaking as a computer scientist, so uh, I'm sorry if, if I'm misrepresenting the, the environment, but my, uh, in ICU, the, the, given the state of the patient, the actions are all often quite prescribed. And so people know uh, what actions they, sh they should take at which point in time. And so our goal is to basically give them more information at, at the given time or flag their attention to, um, to, the, to cases that they might be missing. But when we asked, uh, we did an interview, uh, a set of interviews with uh, colleagues in ICU. And basically what we found is that different people want different information at different times. <laughs> So, so a more senior colleague said, I don't actually need you to tell me anything, I'm fine. Um, uh, or that they would like uh, to get information, but only when the system disagrees with them and they want to know why the system disagrees with them. And that's the only kind of information they ever want. Whereas the uh, fairly junior colleagues were saying, well, actually, I'd like to be validated. Yes, I, I think we, we should be doing this now. 
and I would like the system to confirm that this is this is the right step. This this would make me happy. And so um, there is a lot of the human interaction and in, uh, component and human integration component that we are currently trying to to assess and build out in our ICU systems to make sure that it's the right um, you know sort of the right of the right tool for 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 the for these users. Thank you. Sorry, I, was it long can answer? I ask a follow up because I I think you hit on some beautiful points that are really important for actually rolling this out. And one is is the comment on the, from the ICU nurses about increasing work burden or and the comment of that I don't necessarily want information. I'm not going to act upon it. And so that what this comes down to is really communication and integration with the clinical community and that if you don't have buy-in from them and they're not participating then that's also is that not a barrier to your training and development of these kinds of things and how do how is that being addressed and sorry i i zoned out for a second can you please repeat your question my, my question just had to do with 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 the buy in from the user, so the nurses don't want added workload that's typical for research of the phys physicians and nurses when they're trying, especially in an ICU, which is a high stress situation where things need to be done quickly. At any addition onto the workload is going to be a barrier to participation, but you need participation and buy in from this community or you can't develop the models and the models also are not necessarily going to be as as useful as they could be. So participation and interaction and buy-in of a clinical community into the research area and stream um, is crucially important. How are you addressing that? So one of the ways that we are addressing that is we, we, we basically interact directly um, in addition to clinical champions, we speak to the nursing forums and we, Tell them about the some of this work that we are doing, and we ask them for the for the feedback. What is this okay? Would you like this? What would you like? And so we get a lot of this sort of feedback from the users, and we try to incorporate it into the tools. And then we we present it back, and we say, you know, this is we we are creating these tools for you. We want these tools to be uh, very congruent with what you're already doing. Uh, tell us more. And so people, when they see that they're actually being heard um, of, from the, the, the nursing uh, sort of uh, participants to uh, the senior clinicians, they get engaged more. Some, not all, but what we want is the representatives of the, um, of the community to to make sure that we are actually preparing a tool that is that is uh, really robust for for what's coming, and uh, we also are, are thinking we are piloting for the ICU project. We are piloting this idea to try to do this um, HCI um, particip participatory uh, design where we have a simulated setting, sort of a couple of days where we do a few interviews before we finalize our, our design for deployment. And we incorporate those, um, uh, that feedback into, into the design of the tool as well. So it's, it's difficult because it's also their time, but it's purely on a volunteer basis on, on their part. And I think some, some are interested because you know it brings a different <laughs> flavor to their day, and um, they just get engaged, and then and then you talk to others, so it it helps. Uh, we 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 basically really emphasize that whatever we do is only worth it to uh, to anybody, us or them, is is if we do the right thing by them and we just need some feedback. We'll do whatever they want. So this is, this is uh, how it's been uh, working. Thank you, Dr. Goldenberg. It's great to hear that there's uh, research, you're, you're also looking into the human computer interactions and the user um, interaction and interface part because I think that's overlooked a lot and maybe that is part of the um, slow to adoption piece. Um, does anyone in the audience have any additional questions for Dr. Goldenberg? 
And oh, sorry, a quick question for you. Um, are the slides going to be available? Yes, I'm happy to make the slides available. OK, that sounds good. Um, so we'll send that out to everybody. Um, because if there are no additional questions, we can wrap. Uh, oh, sorry. I have one good. question. Uh, it's Shohai speaking. I'm uh, working at uh, VGH at Vancouver. So we have a similar kind of situation, just trying to implement something in the clinical setting. But so but the validation uh, of the software or tools in the clinical setting could be very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty tricky. Could you talk about uh, the brief touch on your experience on that? Thank you. So um, we have a variety of projects and each of them seems to take a slightly different route. Um, the, what, uh, the strategy we have adopted is based uh, sort of on the strategy of our American colleagues that are a bit further ahead, which is a silent, silent trial. So what we do is we we have a tool we you know install it we we make sure that the data is coming real time to the tool and then we just collect the output of the tools so that's the step one to figure out that the tool is actually running that's technically solid it actually performs at the level that you uh, expected and you would like to guarantee etc cetera, etc cetera. and then with a icu uh, project we actually can't confirm that uh, it's performing quite as needed because we need those labels. And so the, IC, the HCI tool that we developed is for validation of the tool before it would be deployed to assess whether the tool is being useful. Um, we have for the imaging tools in urology, we actually have, um, I think they're almost running an AB uh, type trial where they're, uh, we are there just to give you one word uh, of a description. It's a hydronephrosis uh, project, and we are trying to predict directly from ultrasound whether the surgery is likely to be needed in the future. And uh, we are basically uh, given to some of the clinicians, given the information about uh, whether it's, uh, the algorithm says it's likely and um, uh, assessing it then that way. So there is a lot of, there are, there are a lot of different ways. And I think for different systems, depending on your ultimate outcome, um, the, the validation uh, in, a, in a clinical system will be slightly different. For us, it's easier to deploy a system um, for now that doesn't touch EPIC too much because that requires a different pipeline of the data streaming. But uh, in so this three sort of uh, the ICU and emerge and um, the urology, the three tools are, are quite close uh, to to being finalizing evaluation and and to deployment. And this is the these are the the ways that we we evaluate. Great, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for answering the questions, Dr. Rodenberg. Um, if we, doesn't anyone in the audience have some questions? Okay, um, so we will send out the, uh, the um, this workshop is recorded and we'll send out the um, slides afterwards. Thank you very much everybody for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye.